right, happy 4th of July. I don't know which installment this is or what order we'll be going in doing uh, different parts on American history with David Barton of Wall Builders. If you're not familiar with him, he has a bunch of artifacts here. You're kind of like the Q of American yeah. history artifacts. Um, we'll be doing a few different segments, American, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and today we wanted to get into the Second Amendment. So I know you have a lot of historical documents here, some cool old guns, which I assume I can't touch. No, you're welcome to touch them. Really? Yeah, we, we, we love people touching these guns. You'll Absolutely. regret that immediately. <laughs> um, so let's start off with this. A lot of people have um, different interpretations of the Second Amendment. Right. For example, that it was only for the militia. Right. Was it only for a militia exclusively, or what constitutes? Back up to, to the philosophy. The philosophy was every human has a certain set of natural rights. Right. And those natural rights are what you find throughout nature. So when you get into nature, three things you'll find. If you start messing with an animal, they will defend their lives, they will defend their family, and they will defend their property. And I don't right. care if it's a horse or a dog or a cat or a mountain lion or a bear. So there is a natural right of self-defense. From that, they said, okay, every individual has the right, a God-given natural right to defend yourself. That's mm -hmm. something government can't regulate. And by the way, you can defend yourself individually or you can defend yourself corporate. Was that Kung Fu when you did this? Yeah, I thought you were going to those, that, yeah, okay. Right. That was a little Steven Seagal that's action. Right. Yeah, that's right. okay. That's right. We'll just have one of my stunt doubles I, actually, walk in. I, I learned from Chuck Norris. Chuck did you? Norris, okay, yeah. yeah. I would imagine that's, that you guys yeah, are, are fans. Okay, so, so, so natural right. And natural by the way, right. that, that's also something you talk about quite a bit. These are not rights given by government. They're just recognized. They're by recognized government. by government. They're to be protected by governments, what the Declaration says. And so that right to self-defense can be individually or it can be as a herd of elk. Mm -hmm. or any, so I can corporately get all my neighbors together to defend something, or I can say, I'll take care of it myself. I, right. I got this. So that's what the Second Amendment does. It has an individual part and it has a corporate part. I have the individual right to self-defense, and I have a corporate right of self-defense. Mm -hmm. And the recognition was, we don't care where the danger comes from. It might come from our own government, which is what happened back then. Right. It might come from ga gangs in the neighborhood. It might come from a crazy neighbor or a crazy uncle. So whether it's me or all of us, we've got a right to individually and to corporately do it. And, and it, that's why it's interesting. They had no limitations, really, on how what you could use to defend yourself. Well, I want to get into that in a second. That's also, I think, a, a quote from Mason, if I'm not mistaken. He said, well, why, who is a militia? That's it's the right. entire people, of course. Well, he, here's, here's a great book. This, this early book, okay. this is from Virginia. This is the laws they had in 1819. And it okay. says, if you're 16 all the way up to 45, you're the militia. Every, right. every city, every town, every community, 1645, you're that militia. Right. So that's how informal the organization was. But the law says... Women, were women included? Uh, women were often included, but not in the law. Okay. It, it was people 1645, but women, it was real common to have women with arms. And in the revolution, that was not an unusual thing for sure. women to carry arms. So that was pretty much, they, yeah. they would do that. Okay, so we... We, we actually have a, a great story of what's called the Army of Two in the War of 1812, where two girls took on a British regiment and won. Right. And so it, it's a great story. They turned that into a film, and one of them was played by Michael Cera. It was very, it was wildly popular. Yeah, straight to DVD. Um, so do we, do we have uh, <laughs> Blu-ray, whatever it is now, I have no idea. Do, can, so these are the books that you said, can, can you read us some examples yeah. of the laws in there? Yeah, um, we, I'll just read you some example of, of this law and what's required. If you want to get in and get it up close, you can do that too. I know we're... Uh... So this is all over the state of Virginia, whatever community you live in. It says, and every citizen so enrolled and notified shall within nine months thereafter provide himself at his own expense with a good musket or firelock, with a priming wire and brush, a sufficient bayonet and belt, with a cartouche box, and three pounds of lead, bullets suitable to the bore of his musket or firelock, a good horn containing one pound of powder, and four spare flints, and shall appear so armed, account and provided when called out to exercise your duty if provided therein. So they've already told you it's 16 to 45 up here, and now here's all the stuff you got to have. Okay. you got to be well armed. Now what if you're above the cutoff of 45? You're, you're still well armed. Okay. No, no, no. Right. I, matter of fact, one of the, one of the fun stories uh, of the uh, American Revolution uh, is a, a guy named Samuel Whitmore. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened was the first battle revolution is Lexington, the second is Concord. And so after the British have been hit at Lexington and at Concord, they start marching back to Boston. And as they're doing so, they're just shooting Americans along the way. They, I mean, all along, there were 4,500 Americans lined up along the road on the way back to Boston shooting at them, and they're just taking everything out. So the word goes ahead of the British, 700, 800 British coming, you guys clear your houses because they're just taking people down. Old man, 80 years old, Samuel, he 
said, well, not my house. So he goes inside, he gets his musket, he charges it, primes it, loads it, he gets two pistols, primes it, loads it, he sticks a sword in his belt, he walks outside, sees 800 British coming at him, ups with his musket, shoots one, drops it, ups with two pistols, shoots them. Okay, so on now we're left with 797. <laughs> no, that's right. Still seems like a Still, problem. It is a problem. He goes two more, he kills two more with his pistols. 80-year-old guy, he pulls his sword out and charges the British, one guy going at him. So they have lost three of their comrades right there on the front line. They promptly up and shoot him right in the face, square in the face. Just and of course he hits the ground, that's it. They stand over him, bayonet him 13 times. Then they took the butt of the rifle and just cracked his skull, crushed his skull. They keep moving, we've shown you don't want to mess with us. Um, the neighbors heard the shooting over at old man Whitmore's house and then came to look. And when they got there, he's lying there in a pool of blood reloading his guns to get another shot off as the British were leaving. He lived another 18 years. Lived to be After they, years they butted him in the face After, and bayoneted 13, him 13 bayonet, times? 13 times. And shot him in the face, butted him in the face. He lived in there 18 years. There's a great tombstone to him there, 98 years old. He finally dies after having been. So you didn't get rid of your guns. I, I mean, there was no point in life. Or it's Whitmore. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's like the candy man. You say his name three times in the mirror, he's still liable to show. Oh, he could be. Yeah. He could live forever. On the other end, you got John Quincy Adams when he's eight years old, is with the Massachusetts Minutemen, performs all the drills, does all the musket stuff. So Lexington Green, all that stuff, he, he's out at eight years old getting ready for all of that. So whether you're eight or whether you're 80 or 98, doesn't matter. So that kind of brings us to the next question. You hear this quite a bit. Um, everything you've just talked about, muskets or single shot pistols. A lot of people say if the Second Amendment um, were written today it would be different because they didn't take into account, for example, firearms that might have had higher capacity or uh, were more effective. Do you have any answers for, for those folks? Yeah, you remember they had 10 shot muskets. Remember the muskets they used back then? Yeah. Not I, quite. Well, no, I remember they also had the, the pepper box revolver, right? They did. The, puck, and, the they puckle did have, gun, the Girondoni air rifle. See, the, the deal was you have a right to defend yourself. Right. Whatever you have a right. So the biggest weapon in that day would have been a cannon. Yes. The, hands down, cannon. You're allowed as a citizen to own cannons. Yes, That's that was the, the letter of uh, Mark and Reprisal to, uh, um, was it from... from uh, well, the, you have Madison, you have all the... As a matter of fact... Yeah, was, Ma was it Madison? Well, when you go back in state laws, state laws provide for it. So the founding right. fathers talked about it because you know, what they did was said, hey, don't set your cannon off within a mile of town. We're tired of town getting blown up. Right. You know, but you can have a cannon. You, whatever, whatever the government had, you could have. Right. And that was the belief because we might have to take on the government someday. We hope that never happens. But in case it does, we defend ourselves from anything that comes after us, whether it's from foreign or domestic, whether it's a gang, whether it's a government, whether it's, again, a crazy uncle. Right. We don't care. So for them, there was no limitation on what you could use or how you could defend yourself. So and if your uncle were Sam Whitmore, you were out of luck. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's going to win. Yeah, I know you don't have the letter of uh, Mark and Reprisal. Uh, that this was a letter that was sent to a private ship, right. right? Where you said, yeah, you know, of course you guys have the right to cannons. Right. But do you have some of the laws here that you said uh, some, some? I didn't pull out the laws on, on the cannons. There okay. are a number of them. Pretty easy to Google and search yeah. and see the town laws. And actually, there were some 1830 decisions where that certain towns said, we're not allowing you to have cannons. We're not allowing you to have these weapons. And the court struck it down and said, you can't do that. You, you can't put a limitation on how people defend themselves. Those almost sound like like black cat laws, like don't light off the cherry bombs on 4th of July That's if right. you're on this side That's of the right. county line because it's more of a noise ordinance. That's right. It, it's more of a noise ordinance rather than controlled. And there was fireworks. They had what they called squibs and crackers, what John Adams called them. And there were fireworks ordinances. Don't do them in town. You keep burning down the barn, you know, quit. So they were so okay with cannons, they're though. okay with cannons. And that, was the, that would be our equivalent of high-capacity magazines or machine guns or anything else. It could be equivalent else. to a tank. It could be equivalent to a tank. Wow, right. that is uh, remarkable. And yes, we don't have all of those docs. You have a lot, have but a I'm lot. sure a lot I of those are very cool. expensive. We've got a lot of them back in the archives. We've got thousands and thousands of Okay, thousands, well, so. we can, but you were about to grab something. It looked like the uh, well, weapon that Mel Gibson used. Now, you're, you're going to have trouble with this, but I mean, try hiding these on your persons. You can carry all of these anywhere you go, and these are all American Revolution weapons. So if you want a battle axe, I, I think that would take your, your shorts down. What's left of them, you wouldn't have anything, how heavy that is. That's actually how we trim these available at of the shop .com. <laughs> right. We have someone hand axe them. Wow, and this is made of what? Uh, that is iron, and that is a battle hatchet that is used in the Revolution. Right. So again, whatever you have, that's not a problem with that. You can have the regular dirk knives. That's a 10-inch blade from the American Revolution. Okay. You can stick this in the end of your musket and have your own little bayonet knife and whatever. 
These are pistols from back in the Revolution, and these are battle axes from back there. Well, and I can so see this pistol here, and I'll be bet. very careful. Absolutely. You still have to practice good trigger discipline, even if it probably hasn't worked in 150 years. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting. I have a great letter here from John Quincy Adams, who talks about how his kids are now 10 years old, and I want them trained on the use of guns. He says, because accidental deaths happen because you don't know how to use guns. They don't yeah. come from, from misfiring and firing the wrong stuff. And I'm pretty familiar with firearms. Wouldn't know the first thing about how to get this to work. Do you have any functioning? Oh, yes. Let me grab one here. I'm going to grab right behind. Well, don't fire it in the, in the building. No, we're not going to fire it. Let's yeah. respect the, the, the ordinance in here. Oh, okay. I saw a Christmas story. <laughs> there you go. So what you get is this musket, nice little 78 caliber smooth bore. Yep. So you see how large it is. Mm -hmm. um, we're not gonna prime it and set it off, but what you would do, you cock it back, and by the way, just for grins, there's two positions on this. That's half cocked. Okay. I pull the trigger, it's not gonna go off. It looks like it's ready to fire. This is where you get don't go off half cocked. So this is what okay. you would have said to him. Don't go off half cocked because it's not gonna fire. Okay. If I get all the way back, now what I've done is I poured powder down here out of a powder. It, was that sort of like a safety mechanism? Uh, yes, okay. while you're loading. Yeah. And, and what, what happens is it's not going to fall and, and create a spark and set it off. So you pull it back there while you're loading up with powder. So yeah. what you start, powder here, then you drop a 78 caliber ball, ball on it, then you put wadding in, cram it down so that when you go up it's not going to roll out the end. Then you go right here and you load this with powder. There's a little hole that goes inside. You put this down on top. Now you do a full cock and when I shoot this thing, watch the sparks. Wow. So the sparks set the fire, it goes inside, burns that, that explodes, it goes out the end. And so you got to do this every, now it takes you 15 to 20 seconds to reload every time you shoot this thing. Yeah, that sounds good. So weird. it takes a while, uh, which the problem is your kill range effectively is going to be 30 to 40 yards. And if it takes you 15, 20 seconds, man, a big old NFL lineman can cover 40 yards in six seconds. Right. So you're in trouble, which yeah. is why you then use the, the bayonets that went with these. So now here's the other kind of fun part. How tall are you? Uh, well, with the hat, about 6'9". Without yeah. it, I'm about 6'2". You're 6'2". All right, George yeah. Washington was about 6'2 and 3 quarters. Okay. So you're about the height of Washington. He was exceptionally tall. He was considered to be head and shoulders above his troops. Right. So the average troop is about right here. You're okay. talking 5'1 to 5'4". Yeah. You're Unless you count the, the French level. reinforcements and they're about 4'6". <laughs> That's yeah. right, real small. Yeah. Then, guys. But thank you for helping us out, French. We appreciate Good on you. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that is one time they got to win something. You know? <laughs> yes, yes, they did. <laughs> they got with the Americans and got to win <laughs> That's good something. Good point. Okay. <laughs> so so this, this is what they would have done. So imagine a short guy like this having mm -hmm. to, to carry this and deal with this. Go 40, 50, 60 miles a day in a wool uniform, carry all your stuff with you. These were tough guys, and they ate two meals a day. Yeah. So they are, they're tough guys, but this is individually, and every single 16 through 45 year old was required by law to have one of these, mm -hmm. have all the stuff that went with it, have enough ball and, and powder to, to shoot. And now, is damage. this only if they were actively enrolled in the military? No, or if you're a citizen. Right. If you're a citizen. And that's Matter similar to what they do in, uh, in um, Switzerland. It is. Mistaken. That's right. That is their militia. And, and so in Georgia, for example, you're required to bring your guns to church. If you go to church and everybody went to church, you bring yeah. your guns to church. So there was there was no kind of off limits place in that sense. Some cities tried to pass, you know, no carry zones and of course kept striking them down. I mean, it just it, it right. didn't stand up. It was a natural right and a natural right, as you said before, it's not given us by government. It's recognized by government. It's to be protected by government. But like you said, for some people, they, they might argue, well, this is something that couldn't be hidden. So it was all open carry as opposed to being concealed. And they would say, with go back to this, go back to this, go back to these. You yeah. can hide this under, you know, you got those long jackets. You mm -hmm. put that in, hide it. Um, welcome to hide. But there, you know, one of the differences back then was we also had a common set of moral values. And so sure. whether it be the Ten Commandments or something else, I, we, we have a record of, of one of the founding fathers. His name uh, is, is Justice Kent. And, and James Kent is called a father of American jurisprudence. And he talked about the crime wave that they were having in New York. He was the, the chief legal official in New York. He's the chief Supreme Court justice. He's what's called the chancellor of New York, top legal guy in the state. And he said over, he, he was appalled that over 16 years they had had eight murders in the state of New York. Wow. One every other year, and that's yeah. a crime wave. 
So okay. you, you had a sense of moral value that, that was a little different than where we are today as opposed to Chicago with a killing every eight hours or whatever. Yeah. So the difference was there was no limitation on this because government can't limit your right to defend yourself. What's this over here that I see? This, uh, this almost looks like a, a pump action sort of It uh, is. This is, uh, we're still Second Amendment here. Okay. And this is from a great feminist, except you don't know her that way today. Says Annie Oakley. Here, you might right turn it around so we can see here because you're, you're coming up with your wonderful. Uh, Says Annie Oakley right there, so people okay. know who Annie Oakley is. She was a sharpshooter, and she started shooting when she was about nine years old. By the time she was 15, she had made so much money shooting game and selling it to to meat markets that she paid off the family mortgage. She was an orphan. And, and when so, was this? Uh, sh this would have been man. She was nine years old. Uh, she always had a mom, her mom got married. That's right. Okay. She was without a father okay. for a period of time, but not an orphan. That's right. She had a mom. That's right. But what period in time would this have been? This would have been in, yeah, 1860s. 1860s, okay. 1860s, because she became really famous on the Buffalo Bill uh, Wild West. Yeah. And so this, this was the kind of stuff she would do. She would shoot shotguns, pistols, uh, rifles, right hand, left hand. And she was a sharp shooter. Um, what made her a feminist? Well, she, what made her a feminist was she advocated for all sorts of women's rights. But you don't hear that today because the one right she said especially, here's what makes men and women equal, the gun. Right. If a woman can handle a gun as, as well as she handles a baby, there is not going to be inequality. Right. And so that doesn't line up with modern feminism, but she, she was the first female superstar in a male's world. Right. And she, I, I mean, what she did, these are, are targets that she would use. Uh, in okay. one particular setting, her husband, Frank, they, they had a launcher. It's, it's kind of like a skeet thrower, but it would throw these. And he, sh he threw 5,000 of these out. And with a rifle, not a shotgun, with a rifle, she shot 4,772 of these. It seems needlessly these. ornate. Well, I mean, were, they could just throw out like here's a just a clay ball. Finished. Look at this. That's like a Christmas ornament that you pay a premium for at World Market. This, when it blew up in front of a crowd, you could really see it blow up. Okay. And so this is what they would use in a lot of the shows. And by the way, these were made by the French. So there's a contribution to the French there for you. you. So they made something we okay. could shoot. So uh, she was actually on a tour of Europe in front of the Queen. Uh, this is actually a coin with the Queen's face on it that throw in the air and she would take and shoot through it. So you see the hole through the middle of it. I would be really intrigued to find people that good a shot today. And so this kind of goes back to the, uh, the, the fact that this is in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people are talking about this as though it's new right now. That Well, we don't have this problem of, of these many guns today, oh. um, and they used yeah. to be muskets. No, she was firing something obviously sig significantly more advanced that people would think of as a musket. And you really have to get to uh, the 20th century to sort of look at the restriction on firearm rights. You have to get to the really late 20th century right. to start looking at it. You know, in her case, she actually offered Woodrow Wilson when World War, came, World War I came. She said, I've trained 15,000 women as snipers. I mean, they can go take care of this problem you got in Europe. And he said, no, nah, we're not quite ready for that. But that's how many women she had trained with guns. And so this was so common. As a matter of fact, this, we have a number of these, not Annie Oakley, but these are called gallery guns. Okay. And the reason they are is that carnivals all the way through the 1930s and 40s, you would pay a nickel and get five shots, and kids, this is what they would shoot, it was a 22 at the, at the shooting gallery, right. at, at the carnival. So kids are doing this all the time, and, and there's no big deal over it. We don't think that's a big, big I'm issue. sure there were a few accidents. Well, if, if I, well, th there probably were, but they were very rare. And looking at the founding era, I've only found two gun accidents at all in that era. And, and Jefferson told his 15-year-old, he said, you take a gun with you everywhere you go. That's one of the best forms of exercise you can have. John Quincy Adams, his 10-year-old, he says, I want them with guns. I don't want pistols and rifles. And so they train, because as John Quincy Adams explained, the, the more familiar you are, the less accidents you have. Right. And so that's what they really did. And so... And you have some books here, yeah. From yeah. Is, is this the physical education yes, book? Yes, it is. Okay. This is a, a public school PE book. Right. So PE, and this is from the, all, all the way through the 1970s. And oh my gosh, do we have all sorts of sports here. Uh, if I can get to the front cover of this thing. Yeah, we've got angling and archery and badminton and baseball and softball and basketball and bowling and field hockey and golf and gymnastics and tumbling and handball, handball and lacrosse. And right here, we have an entire section on riflery. Wow. And so this is what we're teaching in the 70s, teaching kids how to handle the rifle, the parts of the rifle, uh, all the different parts. And it sh also shows, along with, with the rifle, targets, how to score target. And it shows you how to use a sling when shooting. Yeah. This is, this is a, 
how to use the sling, and, and here was how to score the targets. Now, would they actually shoot in school ever, well, or was it just theoretical? Here's the interesting thing. They show you how to build a target box. And this is inside a house. You're shooting a 22 inside a house. And as they point out, we use these in gymnasiums and hallways and cafeterias. And if you want more information on this, go to the NRA. So there's public schools saying the NRA is your source on this. Right. But in schools, we have 22s, kids shooting 22s in schools, targets in hallways and cafeterias and other places. And this is in the 70s. So this, I mean, they count. So you build the box in shop, and then you blow it up in PE. <laughs> exactly. Right. You build a box. And it shows you how to, how to make it safe. So all of this, you know, all the different positions for shooting, standing or prone or sitting or whatever. So this is every kid. Let me ask you this, because we start with the, the Second Amendment, as we're talking about. And clearly, if you go through the historical documents, it's meant for more than just muskets, right? There were, so that's right. put to bed. Everyone right. was right. constituted the militia. And now you've showed us these different examples of people who were very comfortable in firing firearms in the schools up until the 70s. When did this sort of phobia of firearms happen? Because it, it, the entire time that I've been alive, it's not been that kind of a scenario. We've always been told that, you know, don't touch a firearm, don't go near it, let a parent know, stay away from it. You'll see a massive change in the value system in the 60s and the 70s. We started saying, don't tell me what's right and wrong, and you can't tell me what's right and wrong, and we can't let... In 1980, the Supreme Court said, you can't let kids see the Ten Commandments. If they saw something like, don't steal and don't kill, they might obey it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're even at the point where we're, we're taking down what was in courthouses because there's moral values attached to it. With that becomes an increase in lack of self-control. Behavior goes the wrong direction, crime starts rising, and our, our answer is don't deal with the thinking process, let's take it out of your hands. Yeah. And that's a crazy thing to do. I mean, for me as a Christian, I'll go back to Cain and Abel. They didn't have guns, so what did Cain do? He picked up a rock and clubbed his brother Abel. So we need rock control laws, that would stop it. it, it it's crazy. I also knew someone who named their son Abel, which sort of seems like you were, you were destining <laughs> him for, for failure. Trouble. But um, we sort of see a bell curve, right? Like you talk about kind of the, se I would say really the 70s, 80s, 90s, particularly sort of came to a crest yeah. in the 90s, the anti-gun sentiment. And now we probably have more firearm uh, open carry Hands rights. Down. Hands yeah. down. And crime has decreased. Crime so crime sort of peaked in the 70s and 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Crime, crime hit a high by about 94, 96. Okay. And so between the 60s and the early 90s, there was a 694% increase in violent crime. It went through the roof. Right. Um, then you start loosening up. People start saying, I want to be able to defend myself. You start seeing all sorts of laws passed for self-defense. Right. And the more areas where you have the more legal guns, the more self-defense you have, you know, Chicago's a gun-free zone, and their murder rates through the roof. Same right. with New York City, et cetera. Yeah. So where citizens have the right to defend themselves, um, I mean, in, in Texas, quite frankly, nobody really wants to break into a house right. because most Texans own about 23 guns, and you don't want to face what's on the other side of the door. Well, now, what would you say to people who compare it, and we do have to get going. I know we have other installments. We have to get to freedom of speech, and we have uh, uh, one on the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. um, pre, well, kind of pre-Second Amendment, but what would you say to people who say, well, internationally, you know, we have the worst gun crime in the world, and so some of them acknowledge everything that you're talking about, but they say, we just got it wrong because we have more violent and more gun You know, we here. do have more crime, but we have more freedom than anybody in the world. We have less government than anybody else in the world. Uh, I like the fact that I can have my own property. I can use it how I wish. I don't have a 68% tax rate like they do in the Scandinavian nations. Mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that I can decide what I'm going to do with my kids. If I'm in Germany and homeschool my kids, I will go to jail. Uh, we have more freedoms. And, you know, that's, that's unfortunately, we don't have the same morals we had for a number of years. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I look at with the Great Depression, when you have so much unemployment, Crime didn't go up, except in Al, Al Capone, organized crime. Right. Because everybody had that sense of the Good Samaritan, the Golden right. Rule, and you know, we did. Now today, if we had a downturn economically today, oh my gosh, it'd be who's got the yeah. Because Maggie they often the say gun. that crime and poverty are sort of synonymous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Great and, Depression. Yeah, the Great Depression proved that 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 didn't happen, and it is it is more of a heart issue in, in so many ways, and we we don't deal with good neighbor. We don't deal with civility and civics and and just the responsibilities. So I think that's coming back, and I know that there is a lot more of that in certain geographic regions of the country, and you see the crime is down in those regions. Yeah. So where there's less civility, you see a lot more crime. 
And even where you, you know, you have very stringent uh, firearm laws in, in San Francisco, they'll just um, defecate on you. They just poop yeah. in the streets. So <laughs> that right. ends up being a different right. problem. A different attack. Final <laughs> question before right. we end this segment, uh, and happy fourth, everybody. What would you say is the biggest misconception, the number one thing that people get wrong about the Second Amendment? It is none of the government's business. It is an inalienable right given us by God. Government can recognize it. It cannot regulate it. And so that's the biggest conception. Go back to the Declaration, read those first 126 words. It says for the five principles of government. There is a God. He gives you a certain set of rights. Those are inalienable rights. Government must protect them. And then past that, you get the right to, c to consent of the government. So our, our decision to choose whether we want gun control laws, that's, that's not our choice. We have the right, it's a natural right to defend ourselves. I'd say that's the biggest misconception, is that government has a right to regulate, it doesn't have a right to regulate our free speech, it doesn't have a right to regulate our private property, those are all, all right. inalienable rights. I think that's the biggest misconception, is we think we've allowed government to have a role it should never have had. I, th that it didn't happen, I think frankly. that's a good point, and I think the undergirding history, uh, and we'll have some links to some of the other historical documents that I highly encourage you to read, because there's obviously a lot to brush up on there outside of just the Declaration and the amendments. Um, well, thank you so much, Mr. Barton. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, there's more. If you tune in, subscribe. I don't know wherever the button, you can point somewhere, and I'm sure we'll <laughs> put the button there. Uh, more to come. Happy Fourth. <laughs>